In your Bible is James chapter number 2, and we've been studying the book of James on Sunday nights. James chapter number 2, and last week the pitfall uh, of preferential treatment and uh, basically how we handle and how we treat rich people, poor people, and uh, treat people uh, in, in general, and uh, we ought to be careful uh, and understand that God showed us mercy, so may we show others mercy. In light of God showing us mercy, and be, be very careful about our, our judgment of other people, even, even on the other spectrum. A lot of times we talk about how we judge people uh, maybe who don't look like we do or act like we do or talk like we do, but the same, uh, in the same respect, don't give preferential treatment to somebody who may have a little more than you do. Don't, don't be uh, led to give them more attention than somebody that may not have anything to offer. Well, I've seen that happen. I've seen people be talking to somebody that a little not, maybe not affluent, maybe come in off the buses, and somebody a lot more affluent, a lot more to uh, come in. Oh, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. And poor old fella over here just standing there. I've seen that happen. And I know sometimes things happen in the excitedness of a moment. But I pray that it would never be intentional. I pray that it would never be because of what that person could, could add to us or do for us. But we come here uh, in verse number 14. What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say hath faith and hath not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food... And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed, and be filled. That's almost a term like the cattle. They, when they talk about cattle being filled, they, it was a term that, that talked about them going out to graze and eating all the grass and herbs till they got absolutely full. So basically he's saying here, if you say to somebody, Be warm, be filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? And what good is it if you just say, hey, uh, God bless you, be at peace. Uh, I hope you're full when you go to bed tonight. Although you had not eaten a week, I just pray some miracle comes to the roof there and feeds you. It's not going to happen that way, but it, it, very facetiously, uh, notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needed with the body, what if it profit? Verse 17, even so faith... If it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yet yeah, man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you thee my faith by my works. Now, back in 2015, uh, in Umqua Community College in Roseburg, Oregon, I don't know if many of you heard about this, and um, there was a, a shooter, and uh, it was on a Thursday evening, and uh, the gunman was a man named Chris Harper Mercer from Winchester, uh, Oregon. And uh, this, this man would walk up to these people at the community college that he shot. And if they said they were a believer in Jesus Christ, he shot them in the head. And if they said they were not, he shot them in the leg or the foot. And this man said he did not agree with organized religion, but he was very religious. You'd like to know what kind. Satanists are religionists. But he, he killed here. And I wonder, I wonder not only if we, if that were to happen to us, and, and many stories have been told about Columbine and, and that, but this is pretty plain and simple here. And many Coptic Christians, those uh, of the, the uh, uh, slint uh, Egyptian faith, and, and I know we use the term Christian broadly when we're talking about overseas and, and all of that. I understand that fully. Uh, but... They, you know, there were, there have been Coptic Christians who, who I would debate on their faith a little bit. Uh, it's not like ours, per se. Uh, but I would say that, you know, nobody deserves to be punished for what they believe. Because we don't. And we, we should afford that same uh, benefit to somebody else. But 
they would ask them if they were a Christian, and they said yes, and they would behead them. ISIS would do this. And uh, I wonder, not if necessarily you would say, yes, I am, or no, I'm not. I wonder if they, if they didn't ask anybody. But they had a three-year span of your life as evidence. Would they be able to say, without a doubt, this person was a believer in Jesus Christ? A follower. When I say believer, I mean believe in action. Uh, not just, uh, yeah, I, I believe that and go on about your business. The devils believe and tremble. I'm not talking about believing and trembling or believing and um, staying the same. I'm talking about a belief that changes behavior. So what a three-day span, a three-year span, or even a three-day span be enough to convict you of being a believer. And James here is drawing us into the fact that, uh, yes, we're saved by grace through faith. But faith has a product. And that product is spiritual fruit. One commentator wrote about this cartoon in the New Yorker. It showed a, a large sign out in front of the church, and it read this. If I had the background working, I would show it to you. The Light Church, L-I-T-E, 24% fewer commitments. This is a sign now. Home of the 7.5% tithe. Some folks are like that. It's not, I mean, that's even better than zero, though. Amen. Amen. 15-minute sermons, 45-minute worship services. <laughs> we have only eight commandments, your choice. <laughs> we use just three spiritual laws, everything you wanted in a church, and less. <laughs> the light church. And we, we laugh at that. And we say, you know, and we laugh and, and cry uh, at the same time. But many people are looking for a light church or a light faith. L-I-T-E, meaning, I guess, less, less invasive, less intrusive, less commitment to it. I mean, uh, uh, when I think of light, a light version, I, I think of something that is, is not as potent or powerful as the full version. Not, you know, it, it's on the lighter side, the lesser side. In our day of minimalist, and uh, there's one area that I, I think it's against the Bible to be a minimalist. And you, you can have as let you can throw everything you want at the house. I, I don't, you know, I'm not going to uh, judge you for throwing everything away and having one shirt, one piece of furniture. That's fine if that's what you want to do. But there's one area where less is not more, and that's in our service to Jesus Christ. It it, it has to be. Uh, it is, our faith is validated by those things uh, that, we, that we do and uh, those things, the, the way that we uh, behave. Now, James here is, in, in his explanation, and I want to show it to you in looking at chapter 2 again, and we'll read our text verse, verse 14. What if it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? And he gives us here in examination, this man uh, that says he has faith, but he doesn't have anything to back it up, can uh, faith save him? And if it's the kind of faith that doesn't put him to work for Jesus, it's not saving faith. Now, we don't work to get saved. We're not, uh, we're not riding bicycles and have white shirts with ties riding bicycles with a name tag on us uh, in order to get to heaven. But we are to witness and we are to work because we are redeemed. We're bought with a price. We'll procure your people. We're set apart. We're separated. We're not of this world. We're pilgrims passing through. We have a job. We have a mission. And that mission is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So, yes, we have a job to do, but we're not working the job to get the reward. We already have the reward, and because we have Jesus, we want to work for him. 
he's a gracious taskmaster. He, and uh, most people are so hard. When you work for him, you want to work less. But Jesus, the more you do, the sweeter the relationship becomes. It's not hard. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. And that's a paradoxical statement. You think, man, that work is not easy. Yokes that slam on your neck and put you to another animal is not an easy thing. I mean, work is indicated when you get in that position. But when we come to Jesus, he makes all of those things delightful because of his person. But he says here, uh, you know, he's asking a genuine uh, a question, a real question. Is your faith genuine? How can you know that you have real faith? And belief and behavior do go together. If you don't live it, you probably don't believe it. And James here in his, in his examination, then he gives us an example in verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and be filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What if it profit? So basically he's saying, and he's not saying that, you know, the, the only measure of your faith is what you do uh, to care for the hurting uh, here. The, the only measuring stick for your faith is not necessarily whether or not you, you clothe those that don't have or feed the hungry. That's not the only measure of faith. So that's not, he's not saying that this is the only measure of faith, uh, but other things matter too. He's not giving us an exhaustive list here. He's just giving us an example. He's saying if this were to be the case, and in James's day it was definitely the case, there was more that did not have than had. And so said, if you see somebody like this, what happens? But he's forcing, forcing us to realize that you can't hide uh, religious activity under the guise, in, in, in the guise rather, of not caring for people. If you're saved, you should care for other people. A nonchalant, uncaring attitude is not the attitude of a believer. And it's impossible. It does go together. Faith and our behavior, faith and our works uh, are married together. They do go together. My faith is dead if I talk without caring. If I talk without caring, if I talk about my faith and we talk about the things that we're good at or that we do for the Lord or all the people we've fed or all the money we've given or all the time we've spent or all the things that we've done and all the places we've been, if all we do is talk about good things, our faith is not validated. My faith is dead if I talk without caring. My faith is dead if I preach without loving. Your faith is dead if you quote the Bible with a pl out of planet in your own life. If you pray on Sunday and don't show compassion on Monday, faith is dead. Living faith is moving faith. Living faith is moving faith. There must be, there will be things that accompany a saving faith. Hebrews chapter number 11 and you know, the, you know the chapter. These believers, their faith was not uh, stable. It wasn't stagnant. It was moving by faith. Abel offered. By faith, Enoch walked with God. By faith, Noah built. By faith, Abraham left the earth of the counties. By faith, Isaac offered. By faith, Moses refused. Real faith, living, vibrant faith for the Lord Jesus Christ is a moving faith. Moving faith. And uh, don't tell me about how strong your faith. Yeah, I'm a person of faith. I'm a man of faith. I'm a woman of faith. And as I said before, Wednesday night, if you have to say that, there may be reason you have to say it instead of do it. For instance, if you're at work, sir, and you're the boss, and you got to say you're the boss... You're probably not the boss. You're probably not the boss. And so if you've got to say, look, uh, I'm a person of faith. 
then your faith is not doing enough to validate itself. By faith, the people marched around the walls of Jericho. By faith, Rahab hid the spies. And they saw uh, great victories. Some saw victories. Others were, were sawn asunder. And uh, all of these were, were approved by God. Why were they approved by God? Because their faith moved them uh, to action. Active faith releases God's power. Passive faith is dead, useless, and empty. It is. And uh, somebody said this, faith is a living, restless thing. It cannot be inoperative. Faith cannot be inoperative. Faith is, is living and breathing and doing. Not doing to please uh, or appease some uh, little G God. But our faith should be living and breathing and vibrant. I mean, it ought to be visible. It ought to be vibrant. Because Jesus Christ, through the person of the Holy Spirit, lives within us and does a work through us. And that will come out. As Warren Wearsby says, you can no more stick your finger in a 220-volt socket and not be uh, changed as you can to be saved and not be changed. It will change you, and it will cause you to move forward, move forward. True living faith, which the Holy Spirit instills in the heart, cannot be idle. And true believers should, they should show their faith through their works. And uh, we've been redeemed, those of us according to Titus 2, uh, 14, I read that this morning. And uh, we should show our faith. It should be seen uh, of others. And so he says here in verse 15, if a brother, and of course, uh, that's, that's of the household of faith. We're not talking about somebody just out here. He's saying if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food. I mean, this is somebody who, who's one of us. And, uh, you know, faith is the grace which marries Christ and good works are the children that faith bears. Faith is the grace which marries Christ and good works are the children which faith bears. Faith will have fruit. Faith without works is like a screen door on a submarine. It's not going to work. A workless faith is a worthless faith. Worthless. If you are arrested, is there enough evidence to convict you? Is there enough? In 2002, in the city of Kansas City, they had the highest death rate among cancer patients. And everybody just started going nuts because they thought, why in the world does is is Kansas City have the highest death rate among cancer patients? What is going on? And it was so peculiar, it was, it was in this one neighborhood. If you lived in this one neighborhood and you had cancer, the probability of your dying was two to three times higher than anyone else in the country. So this is very curious, and they, they got to investigate because they thought, man, these people in this one town are dying uh, two to three times faster than other people with the same, the same cancers. And after years of investigations, it turned out the pharmacist in that local neighborhood was diluting all the medications that he was giving out in order to double and triple his profit. Forty, in 10 years, 4,200 patients he Gave medicine to 100,000 different prescriptions given out over a 10-year time. Everybody was taking this pill thinking they were getting better. They were trusting. I mean, they, they, they thought it was like they were taking a placebo. They weren't getting anything. The medication had no effect. It was useless. Medication was useless. It was death to them. And quite literally, it led these people to their death. And might I say, James here is talking to the person that you think you have the right faith, but if it's just not doing anything, you think, I'm saved, I'm saved. I know what you're talking about, Brother Man. I'm saved, I got the right faith. If you, if you say you have the right faith, you will do something. Amen. Just like this pill, if it was the right medicine, and it, it would do what it was supposed to do. 
So if you got the right faith, it's a misnomer for you to think that you can have the right faith and not have the right fruit. And, and I, I've been around it all my life, Brother Vanford, of Christians and believers that, that, that try to convince me that they're saved. I, I know I'm saved. I've never tried to talk anybody out of it anyway. Oh, I know, I, I know I'm saved. I know, I know when it happened. It was right, right, um, I was, yeah, it was wintertime. I know when it happened. You know what? You don't have to remember the date when you got saved. You don't have to remember that. I remember the date. I remember the time. I remember the place. I remember what number of pew I was on. But that, that don't mean I'm saved. Dates, times, and pews don't mean you're saved. Hey Amen. It's Jesus. It was just an encounter that I've never forgot. And, but, I, but I will tell you that you may not know the day. You may not know the time. You may not know exactly... But I'll guarantee you there has been a change and there will, there will be fruit produced in your life that's conducive to a believer. You're not going to live 10, 15, 20 years. Listen, if there's a grapevine outside of your house and it's been around for 15 years and you've never seen a grape on it, there is no way in your right mind you're going to keep it around. You're going to cut that thing down, throw it in the fire. It wasn't, I don't know what they sold you at Webster's, but it wasn't a grapevine. Amen. But yet we have believers, oh, yeah, I'm saved. But there's no fruit whatsoever. There's nothing you can point to and uh, say, you know what? I, I have a validation for the fact that I've been saved. Right here it is, Pastor. God put a desire in my heart for his word. God put a desire in my heart to see souls saved. God put a desire in my heart to be in the house of God. God put a desire in my heart to be around other believers. Okay, now we're headed somewhere now. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, not an old one, not the same one. He's a new one. So there will be a difference. If you are here tonight, you're trying to convince yourself that you're saved, but you had not got enough evidence to convict your own self of it, you're believing a lie. You've convinced your own self that you're, not, that you're saved and you're on your way to heaven, but you have not one, one iota of evidence. Not one. And it's not my job to make you doubt it, but it is my job to, to make you look at it. Because this is the perfect law of liberty. This is the mirror. So it is my job to help you look in the mirror. It is my job to help you examine the orchard. It is my job to look and see if you are in the vine. And whether there's fruit or not, and I ask you tonight, are there fruit? Is there fruit in your life? And it's just some things that ought not be named in a, in a believer's life, period. I mean, there's certain activities that you think, oh, here we go, the, you know, the negatives, the things we cannot do. You know, nobody got up. I, I, I know some churches, Brother Fredericks, have got up and, and harped on things, and my preacher didn't do that. But you know what? It was amazing, Brother Josh. I mean, man, God just convicted me of stuff. My, my preacher didn't preach on stuff every Sunday about, you know, stuff that, that was happening. But the Holy Spirit sure got me. Yes, sir. My man, he nailed me. And that preacher never said anything about it. But boy, I was sitting in that pew and it got harder by the minute. And hotter. And the Come seat on. was harder. Come on. And my, my palms started sweating. I'm thinking, how does he know, I, I, you know, I ain't right there? But he didn't even say nothing about that. Isn't it funny how we get stuff out of the Bible when we're sitting there and listening and the Holy Spirit's convicting us? He never even said, didn't even mean it that way. People have talked to oh, boy, you must have been listening to us, Pastor. You must have really, uh, you, might, you got a recorder over there. No, it's called the Holy Spirit. I don't, I don't go, you know, eavesdropping and try to get information to preach on. The Holy Spirit's been doing that a long time for me. He's got all the information he needs because he knows us inside and out. And, and it's his job to do that. And he does the work. And, boy, he, and, and there's going to be times in your life when you, if you say, Pastor, number one, I've never been under conviction. Somebody that's never been under conviction has never been saved. 
And I'll say this, I'll go a step further. If you say you're saved and you've never been chastised, the Bible says it for us. You're not his. Right. Bible plainly says that. Right. You're none of his. If you, if you say you've been born again and you've never, you can't pour it to a time when you've been down by the woodshed, there's no perfect people in here. Right. If you've never been chasing of the Lord, then it's not his. You're not his. I, I wish sometimes, Daddy, I wish, I, you know, I got the best parenting. Look, can I just tell y'all something? I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I got the hardest working daddy in the world. 68 years old, can run circles around me with a weed eater or anything else. I mean, worker. And my mama, she's, you know, she's the originator of ADHD, I think. <laughs> she, brought it, she brought it with her. And just, you know, 5 o'clock in the morning, slinging pots and pans. I got to work in his mom and daddy and, and love, loving his mom and daddy. Best hearted daddy. He'd give you anything he had. And, and the, but, but when I was a, it's beeping a little bit. It's just flash flood. It's okay. Okay. We're, we're on high ground. We're on dry ground. We're okay. And, the, but you know, we all go through this. Y'all know this. We all go through this. Sometimes, sometimes, Brother Fredericks, I, I would have wished when I was a, when I was a boy, I'd wish. That's a couple things I wish for, Brother Randy. Number one, I wished I had brothers and sisters. My mom couldn't have any more, but I, I always thought I was, you know, put out because I didn't have. Now I see it's, it was pretty good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have. And then sometimes I thought, I'd like to have a different mom and daddy. Y'all all have been there. They've been times, and you know what that's the cause of. The reason that is is because you done got in trouble. Oh, when he brought that, that nice ERTL, Ertl uh, truck, that stainless steel truck for me, that Chevrolet truck that you roll out in the dirt, when they brought that home, he was the best daddy in the world. <laughs> but by the time, you know, he found out something that I wasn't supposed to be doing and he got me, he wasn't, he wasn't a good daddy no more. But here's what he never did that sometimes I wished he would have done. I wish he'd have said, he looked at my uncle. There have been times when I thought he'd look at my Uncle Daryl and say, Daryl, he's my son, but I want you to just take him and you, t you discipline him. And you. There's times I, I wish he'd have done that because I think Brother Uncle Daryl would have been a little easier on me. <laughs> but you know, God, if you're his, he's not going to pass off discipline. Yeah. Right. My daddy never looked. Daryl, you just handle him, would you? I wanted that sometimes because I knew, I mean, if he got a hold of my hair back here, it was not a good thing. Y'all don't even know what that is. It's probably child abuse now. <laughs> but he'd get a hold right under my hair and let me know that I was, you know, we were in the room together. There's nothing wrong with that. That's okay. Amen. I, it's okay. Everything's all right. And, uh, and, and he, he said, now, son, hold on a minute. And I'd be, you'd get a little smart, and y'all did too. And, and he'd grab, reach around my neck there and just grab that little, the, you know, because back in the 70s, we had a lot of hair. <laughs> and he'd just let me know that everything was okay and he was in charge. And that's okay. That's all right. Y'all ain't, ain't getting enough on that. That's what's wrong with these kids now. Amen. They've not been disciplined. Amen. I'm not talking about anger. I'm not talking about going, uh, getting mad at them. I mean, Bible discipline, doing it the right way, at the right time, Amen. with the right spirit. That's what's wrong with them now. Right. They're getting away with murder. Right. I'd love to have, I'd love to get away with half of what these kids do now. Amen. My goodness, they're having a time. Yeah. My daddy, they, I don't even want to think about it. I just cringe thinking about it. My papa, my papa would even get out of his chair for some of that stuff going on now. You know, Papa don't get out of his chair. He doesn't raise his. He just sits back and everything's happy, you know, lovey-dovey. If Papa saw some of the stuff going on, he'd get up out of his chair, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Amen. And we need some of that. But God never puts it off on anybody else. Right. So if you're his, you know what's going to happen? He's going to do it. Amen. He's going to do it. If you're his child, I just don't know why all this stuff's happening to me. Well, 
The Lord may be disciplining you. He may be working on you. He may be working on you. But listen, if you say, I don't even know what you're talking about. It's never happened to me. Well, you just told on yourself. Because God's not going to pass that off. If you're his, he's, he's going he's to deal with you. He's going to take care of it. You better believe he is. Verse 16, and one of you say to them, depart in peace. Be warm, be filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful uh, to the body. What doth it profit? Verse 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. I mean, it's dead being uh, no Nobody is going to say, hey, I'm saved if they're not doing something that looks like salvation. He said if faith if it's faith, if it's really faith, it's going to have what? It's going to have works, or what is it? It's dead. It's useless. It's ineffective. So you see, we see this stuff in verse six, verse 15, verse 16. What are we doing about stuff? What are we really? And it's not just feeding people and sending and going and getting clothes. There's, there's people that need stuff around you. I give, I give, and I'm not to toot my own horn. I'm just, it, don't tell me you don't see this. Like there's never a time when you have an opportunity you, to, to be a Christian. Right. This old boy was walking up my street the other day. Ricky, he lives down my road. And I, I know he probably, cut that live stream off just a minute in case Ricky's watching. If not, it's a worthless faith. It'll be a working faith. And uh, help people. Help people that can't help themselves. And uh, I mean, and, and, and he's talking about brothers. There's brothers and sisters right now that you know need help. And you won't help them. 
we got one of the most loving churches in the world, but I'm sure there's people that need things and people won't help. Now, I'm not talking about people that won't work and all that, but sometimes if you if you go, listen, it's 710, it's still raining, so we're better in here. If you're going to do this all the time, look, if you're going to do this all the time, if I loan Jordan four quarters, and if he, if he tells me I'm going to give him all four quarters back, and they got to be the same year as the ones I give him. <laughs> Y'all know anybody like that? I know some. If he loans me four quarters, I better have it. Now, he ain't this way. I'm just being putting this on here. Can you imagine if he said, I want them four quarters back, and they better match too. If you're a note taker, you're never going to help anybody. If you're, if you're worried about return and notes, it's one thing to be worried about the stock market if you've got retirement. But if you're worried about getting something back on the things you give to the work of God, if you're taking notes about everything you put in, right. hey, throw the paper and pen away and let the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. help you and lead you. Amen. And why, why don't we help somebody sometime? Quit taking notes of it. Quit ta- keeping, keeping record. And, well, I help them twice. It's their turn now. I don't find that in the Bible. It's your turn now. No, no, no. It's our turn all the time. We're saved and called and on our way. to. It's our turn all the time. Now, I went out to eat with people, and you have too. And, and now, who bought last time? I bought last time. Okay, it's your turn. And I understand that. But not, not keeping record of everything we've done good. And now, Ricky, I gave you a ride up to the store. Now you know that, you know that garden down there, that them uh, raised beds. I said, hold on a minute. I said, we're neighbors. I said, we don't keep score for neighbors. I said, I I love you. You're my neighbor. And if I can't help you, who can I help? I said, whatever you need, whatever I got, you can use it. Whatever you need. And and, and, and then then when he gets, when he brings sausage from the work, I get my bill full out. I don't expect him. But God's people, we ought to be looking for people to help. And don't keep, don't worry about it. Yes, don't worry about it. Just do it. Because really, if you re- got real faith, it'll break out on you like the measles. You won't be able to keep it hid. But if you got a lifeless, dead faith, they won't nobody in the world believe you. They won't nobody in the world believe you're saved. If you've got a salvation that won't work, won't nobody in the world believe you're saved. But if you're really born again, you got genuine faith. There will be stuff to back it up. You can look back and say, yeah, that, yeah, he's, he's a real deal. She's a real deal. Look at that. And I appreciate this church. But I want to tell you, we got more to do. We got more to do. There's people everywhere. And they need the gospel. I understand. Don't, we don't clean up the water and give them clean water and don't give them living water. I, I know that. Let's do both. Let's give them that living water first. I know if they're thirsty, how are they going to hear you? Well, they, they got 15 minutes. But boy, we got a lot to do. We got a lot to do. Amen. There's people out here that need Jesus. They need us. We got tons to do. And it grieves my heart to see so much potential right here. I'm done now. I'm done. It grieves my heart to see people sitting here. And boy, we got so much potential. Oh, we got potential. Yeah. I mean, it's, it just, I, for the forest, there's churches around here that would, that would, I mean, just salivate to have this many people on a Sunday night service in the middle of a hurricane. Raining. And you're here. The lights went out this morning. You came back. 
Can you imagine how much potential is here to change the world? I was talking to a preacher, and this is the last illustration. I was talking to a preacher the other day. He said, you know what? I've tried to do everything I know to do, every, every new thing I can, you know, every program, every little ministry. I've tried to jump on it. And, you know, sometimes we get involved in stuff that God didn't intend for us to get involved with. Good stuff. We get loaded down. And we start limping like this. We're not whole because we, got, we, got, we say yes all the time to everything. And sometimes it's a choice between good and best. And so I was talking to him about all that. And uh, he said, you know what? He said, I've understood. He said, I, God had to help me realize. He said, I'm trying to, I'm trying to reach this, this town, this community. I'm trying to reach them all one time. He said, I understand. It's one at a time. And he started mentoring a little family. A sister got saved. The other sister got saved. The boy got saved. And working on the mama. And coming, and, and I met him the other week, and they were just some of the most polite kids you ever want to meet, and they grew up in terrible conditions. He said, Pastor, I want to do something. Let's do it one person. Get, you find somebody, find something to do, and do it. When we got people, we got places to do it here on the buses. We got families that need help. We got all kinds. Of, you, you know, you got people in your neighborhood. Them boys that keeps riding a bicycle in your yard, why don't you go talk to them? Go tell them about Jesus. Them ones that gets on your nerves and makes all the noise in your neighborhood, go talk to them. I'm thinking about setting up a soul winning ministry right here in our parking lot as many people turn around. I tell you what, that'd stop them from turning around and sitting. If every time they stopped, they had somebody with a gospel track up the window. That'd that cut out a lot. Of, you don't need no signs if you do that. You don't need no do not park signs. Just hit them with a the track every time they come in the parking lot, and they'll, they'll get the message. <laughs> hey, let's do something. It's our turn all the time. The world's depending on you. James says, you got good faith? Show me your works.